Hi there and good evening on this lovely Friday afternoon slash evening slash morning, depending on where in the world you are. I'm your host Gina Hoske and I want to welcome you to uh, Octoprint on Air number 32 live uh, for my patrons at the $5 level. And of course, the recording will also be made available afterwards. Um, as usually, uh, as usual, a short outline of what I'm going to talk about today to you. Um, first of all, I'll give you an overview of what I have been up to ever since the last uh, broadcast that I did, um, or rather the last Octoprint on Air broadcast. I should maybe uh, clarify because we also have uh, Octoprint code and chat uh, here and there. Um, then I'll talk about what the next steps will be. So what the next stuff that I'm going to tackle uh, is going to entail. Then we'll have uh, a quick look at the stats of the anonymous usage tracking plugin as usual by now. And then we'll come to our Q and A se section where I think we have something like five questions prepared from the spreadsheet. Uh, but I'll also keep an eye on the, on the live chat, which, uh, where, where you can also ask additional uh, questions, of course, which I then try to tackle if there's still time. Uh, live chat on desktop should be over there and on mobile down there, uh, hopefully at least. <laughs> and uh, yeah, as I said, I'll keep an eye on that as usual. Okay, so what I've been up to. Um, the biggest chunk of tasks that I've been tackling over the past couple of weeks have actually been related uh, relating to um, yeah, long needed automating and process optimization and mostly actually related to the plugin repository. So what I did was uh, so far, so maybe I should start a bit a bit earlier. So the plugin repository as it is uh, today, which you can find on plugins.octoprint.org is a static web page, which is generated using Jekyll, which is also what powers GitHub pages. And so far it, it lived on GitHub pages. So it only had access to the plugins on GitHub pages and it could only be generated from whatever was in the repository at the given time. And um, I've now um, removed it from the regular GitHub pages page build and instead have set up uh, a GitHub action powered page build process. And that gives me the chance uh, to also yeah, enrich the data, uh, all the all the plugin repository data, for, so all the register plugins uh, with additional stuff before I actually build the page and then publish it on the on the web for everyone to see. And uh, that's what I'm now doing. So I'm now injecting a ton of <laughs> additional uh, statistics and such into the static page sources before before build. Uh, so that is why now we have um, for uh, for plugins that are hosted on GitHub, we now have the latest version that was released and the date of the release. We have the date of the latest commit to the main branch. So whatever is configured under GitHub as default branch, uh, the last push to that will, uh, or the date of the last push to that will also be shown uh, in the plugin repository now. That way you can, um, uh, you can determine the activity of the plugin uh, a bit better. A uh, number of active installs uh, or, um, across all instances over the past 30 days, uh, over, uh, across all instances that have opted into the anonymous usage tracking, I should uh, add, um, because that's where this data is being taken from. A uh, number of open issues, number of closed issues, stars on GitHub and all that. And um, and a recent addition uh, is that, so we had this problem that a lot of plugin authors apparently didn't get the memo that they need to um, not only need to uh, mark their plugin as uh, Python 3 compatible in, in the source of the plugin, but they also need to send a PR to the plugin repository. Uh, because otherwise the plugin repository won't know that the plugin is now Python 3 compatible and thus will not display it as compatible in the browser built into Octoprint. So that was a bit of a problem. And uh, yeah, I fixed this also by a pre-processing step, um, or, uh, which involves now reaching actually reaching out, the page build will now reach out to plugin um, repositories uh, if, if no compatibility flag is set and try to extract this information from the plugin sources. Um, and that has uh, actually discovered something like 20 plugins or so, which had not, did not have it set and which now makes it so that uh, 
I think 59% or something. Yeah, 59% of all plugins on the plugin repository are now officially Python 3 compatible, um, which is really, really good news um, because that is like, yeah, the 50% was like the magic barrier for me um, to consider, uh, yeah, looking into making Octopi or, or creating an, or, or talking to Guy to create a uh, Python 3. Um, Python 3 Octopi build and all that. But yeah, we get to that later. Anyhow, uh, we now have some usable stats uh, on, on the plugin repository page. And um, yeah, with this data now being injected, it also allows us stuff like the top 10 of the month or uh, stuff that got installed a lot in, in, in the last seven days and such. And um, all of this data is also now available to the plugin manager in Octoprint and used there. And I, and I just finalized uh, the, the visuals of that today. And I thought I would just um, give you a quick demo of how things look like now on the plugin repository and also on the maintenance branch of Octoprint uh, so that you know what uh, awaits you when 141 hits. Yeah, so I'm going to share my, uh, my screen here with you. Yeah, so uh, this is the plugin repository. And uh, this is the top 10 and the, the weekly trends stuff that I just mentioned. So uh, this now gives you a good indicator of really, really popular plugins. And if we uh, just click at one, for example, the firmware updater uh, one here, you, we also now get a ton of additional metadata over here. So active instances the past month, new installs the past week, latest release, when it was released, how many releases are there, how many stars. And I'm also looking into maybe allowing you to star stuff on GitHub from the plugin repository, but more on that later. Uh, how many open, how many closed issues, and when, have, when did the last push to the default branch happen? And if we now take a look into Octoprint, um, uh, one for one dev, so a maintenance build, and uh, look into the plugin manager here and get more, then we see a lot of this data also reflected here. Um, so this is uh, this is data we also we actually already had. Uh, this is the the, the published public, uh, published date. So when the plugin was first published. This is the active instances the past month. This is the number of GitHub stars. This is the last push to the main branch. And this is the latest release and date of release. And we can also sort by all of that now. So for example, if I want to know which plugin was the one which, yeah, if I want to sort by, by last latest release, then I can see that, oh, the ETP link smart plug, uh, plugin by, by Jim just got a release today, actually. Um, yesterday, there was a new one of the Octoprint Display ETA uh, uh, plugin and all that. So all this information is now in here. And uh, you can use it also to determine, yeah, the, the quality or maybe the activity of a plugin. And um, yeah, of course, you can also sort all of the plugins by the active instance count. So really get a nice view over the popularity. And another thing that was added here, let me quickly switch back to sort by title, is this one, only show unabandoned plugins. So we sadly had to discover that some of the plugins out there, um, or uh, as, as was to be expected, let me quickly, yeah, so that you also can see me. Um, yeah, some of the plugins out there are sadly no longer being maintained uh, by their authors. And uh, yeah, when I get uh, a notification about that now, so you can, there's a new template type on the plugin repository where, by, via which you can report a plugin um, which looks abandoned. And if there is, so the, the, the idea is that you um, open a ticket on the, on the plugin repository and if there's no reply by the maintainer within 14 days, then you can open another ticket in the plugin repository uh, from Octoprint, and then we can um, uh, set the abandoned flag on it and also look if maybe someone wants to adopt it. And this abandoned flag will now also be evaluated by the plugin manager so that you can filter stuff out. And uh, if I now, 
So now uh, there are now 227 plugins all in all in the plugin repository. And if I filter out anything that is marked as abandoned, I can see that currently four plugins are marked as abandoned. My money is on there actually being more than four, but so far I have not gotten reports about that. So if you are using some plugins which haven't seen updates in ages, but, and this is the important thing, but they need updates because they are buggy or they are not yet compatible to Python 3 and there is no movement or no reaction at all from the plugin author about that, then please mark them as abandoned um, so that we can, yeah, identify such plugins and maybe also find someone who wants to adopt them, which would be the ideal case, of course, because then they, yeah, will continue to live, so to speak. Okay, so yeah, so that is the current, uh, or rather the changes to the plugin manager. Yeah, I also changed some ordering of stuff here and there, but yeah, basically this is hopefully going to help a bit with navigating the quite enormous amount of plugins we by now have. And also let me just quickly, if I search here, also the, the number of search hits will be displayed. So this is working nicely. Yep, so this is what I wanted to show you all. Um, and then let me quickly switch back over here. Right, hi. Um, and uh, another huge chunk of what I did was um, the docs.octoprint.org page. Uh, so far was only what was, was uh, hosted by readthedocs.org, which is a, a really great service for open source projects to host their documentation, uh, especially for Python stuff, because they specialize or, uh, in, in, in things, which is like the go-to documentation engine for, for Python. Um, but over the years, I had some problems here and there with builds uh, failing for weird reasons or uh, also something that, that really bothered me was insisting on re-enabling certain branches, even though I did not want them to have their documentation build and all that. And yeah, I switched the docs build over to GitHub uh, Actions as well. And now, um, yeah, I have way more control over it. I can I can determine which versions get built and which don't get built myself and it works and I have full control over it and yeah that was way overdue that was something that I had been meaning to do for two or three years at least now um, though at first I wanted to do it with Travis but now with GitHub Actions yeah it's just really it's already built in you know it's it's really trivial to to get stuff working with that Okay, and uh, what else did I do? So I already mentioned uh, that I adjusted the plugin manager to uh, include all the stuff that we now have available on the plugin repository, all this metadata. And uh, I also did some more fixes and features that will uh, go into one for one. Uh, in the plugin manager, especially, there's something that I um, also have been meaning to do for a couple of years now. Um, so I, yeah, I talked about that already in the last Octoprint code in chat, which is where I actually uh, developed, um, yeah, the biggest chunk of this feature. Um, Octoprint knows two types of plugins. Um, the ones that you know from the plugin repository uh, are the big ones, the, the, the full featured package ones, which can also bundle front end and back end stuff and define requirements uh, for, for dependencies and all that. But Octoprint also supports uh, single file plugins, which are just simple file, uh, simple uh, single Python files, uh, self-contained plugins, which you can just dump into a special folder inside Octoprint's data folder. So an Octopy that would be in uh, uh, .octoprint slash plugins, and you just throw the Python file in there and restart Octoprint, and then you can use this plugin. And uh, yeah, these single file plugins are especially in interesting for stuff like firmware workarounds and and things like that be, because they yeah when you only need to do something in the back end and um yeah maybe rewrite some some quirky um response that the firmware generates or something like that into some standard conform one then you can write such a plugin and so far if you then wanted to install it or if you if others wanted to install it then they had to ssh into the machine and then navigate to the folder and copy the file into there and all that and that was a bit annoying 
So now Octoprint supports a uh, single file plugin installation also via the uh, yeah via the get more link. So there is this. Let me quickly just switch back over here <laughs> and display uh, show it to you. So you can now just either drop in the URL to the single file plugin here, or um, also select it here for uploading and then just install it via. Yeah, via these buttons, and that works great. Um, I have, I actually have an example of a plugin that I installed uh, that way. Let me quickly, right here, um, which I threw up into a into a gist, and um, yeah, I can now just install it with uh, by going here to raw. And then copying that URL and dumping it into Octoprint. And what I also did um, was uh, I figured it won't help you much if you can install these plugins, but then have no way to get updates if the owner of the plugin updates it. For example, if there is a plugin like this one here on the GIST, uh, on, on GIST.github.com, maybe if the author changes stuff in there, it's fixes bugs. I mean, it's, it's a really short plugin, 31 lines, but it could still need bug fixes or it could need a Python compatibility change or something like that. Wouldn't it be nice to be able to get software updates for these as well? And so I added a bunch of additional uh, software update types. So there is now, um, uh, yeah, the, the method is single file plugin. So it will, that tells it to, uh, instead of trying to pip install whatever it, uh, ca comes in, to just take the file that comes in and install it into this plugin directory and be done with it. And um, there are also a couple of new, um, let me show it you, uh, show, show you here maybe, and on the maintenance branch actually. This is also new, by the way, so that you now get a bit of a heads up if you are not on the on the on the current stable versions uh, uh, documentation, um, and what I wanted to show you is these new types. So um, regarding version checks, so far there only was GitHub release, GitHub commit, GitHub Bitbucket commit, Git commit, PyPI release. What is new now is HTTP header. So um, you can tell Octoprint to fetch. Uh, data from, or rather, to to do a head to do a head request against, um, unless you configure a different type, to do a head request against an HTTP endpoint, and that will uh, and then look up uh, the value of a of a certain header, and that allows you to check if an e tag changed or if the last modified date check uh, changed or something like this, um, and this works great with uh, with GIST. So you just uh, tell it to fetch the the e tag and uh, then it will detect if the file changes. Um, oh, I have to remove that one. <laughs> that is outdated. I merged the, this one into, into HTTP header. And uh, I also added something called JSON data, uh, which will uh, download, or, or rather, which will query a provided JSON endpoint. And that JSON endpoint needs to return uh, just an, an object with a version string in, in there. And uh, that way you can also trigger an, an update. So if this version, this reported version changes. Um, yeah. And update methods are already mentioned, the single file plugin. And this is actually the only new thing here. Yeah. But uh, yeah, and I also added some um, configuration examples on how to use this stuff and also especially how to utilize uh, the, 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 yeah, or rather how to configure things for GIST hosted single file plugins. So I hope this helps plugin developers out there who just want to quickly whip up a, a single file plugin to solve some firmware work and then um, make it available to the community. And I'm also thinking about somehow making single file plugins registerable into the uh, into the plugin repository. Currently, this is not possible because yeah, it's simply not prepared for that. Um, but uh, long term, that would also be a goal here, if there is demand. So um, yeah, I'm I'm going to look how how utilized single file plugins will be now that, that you can easily install in that way. Like how often they pop up on the forums and all that, and then we'll see. Right. Um, back to me.
back to me, I said. Yeah, okay, perfect. Um, and uh, yeah, other than that, uh, I also did the usual amount of bug fixes and some little improvements and all that. So there was, we, we finally upgraded the tornado dependency because of, yeah, it was overdue again. Uh, so Sean, aka Can't Live Long, uh, sent a PR and that worked great until I noticed that it broke parts of the push socket implementation. And yeah, so that was a ton of fun to debug, but I figured it out and solved it. And, um, and now that works again. And there was, and it's also future proof for Tornado 6, actually. <laughs> um, uh, I also find, found a bottleneck in the file processing uh, hooks for, for plugins uh, that can be used to rewrite a plug uh, to rewrite an, a file when it gets uploaded. That was there. Uh, there was a bit of a of a, of a of a performance bottleneck, and that's now gone as well. Um, and there was a memory leak and some shared nozzle temperature reporting issues and all that. So a ton of stuff that I don't want to go into too much detail here now because it would just bore you all to death probably. Um, but uh, yeah, a lot of stuff has been happening and 141 looks good. So um, uh, there is not not much left in the in the uh, in the issue tracker currently that is targeted for 141. And I'll take a look at what is left um, early next week, and then we'll see about look. Uh, yeah, then I'll, I'll see about uh, a first release candidate. But I'm getting I'm getting ahead of myself because that is actually part of the next steps. Uh, there's still two things that I want to mention uh, what I did. Um, so um, those of you with the project a bit longer might remember that GitHub there there was a wiki on GitHub um, where there was also a list of supported printers and cameras and whatnot and uh, various sort guides more some more outdated than others uh, on how to set up Octoprint and various hardware, software, whatever configurations. And what I finally did, also something that I've been meaning to do for two or three years now, is uh, I migrated all of that stuff off of this GitHub uh, wiki and into the guides uh, and or FAQ sections in the community forums, um, uh, where they are, by the way, also parts of wiki notes. So uh, Discourse, which is the software we use for the community forums, has this concept where if you gain a, a certain trust level, so a certain, yeah, how, how to say, a certain regular status on a forum. So if you go there and, and read and are an active member, then you, you go through trust levels and anyone from the first trust level up already can edit wiki notes. So uh, that should hopefully help to uh, still have it community maintained, but also have it managed a bit better so that not everyone can just yeah, come in and vandalize the wiki, uh, or rather the, the, yeah, the knowledge base, so to speak. Uh, and it was also a logical step because the whole wiki, uh, the whole uh, forum also acts as the uh, central octoprint knowledge base now. So, um, uh, yeah, that was, that was long needed to migrate that stuff over so that it was not fragmented uh, like it was before. And another thing that I did, um, yeah, you might remember that last time I was still wondering if I should maybe um, make the devil branch, yeah, go full backwards incompatible already and call to call it 2.0 uh, as, as, as um, uh, accordingly. And uh, yeah, considering that devil definitely, <laughs> I, I don't see devil getting released um, still within the next, I don't know, four or five months or something. I haven't really even started working on it after the after the 140 uh, release, thanks to the pandemic hitting and all that. Um, so it will definitely no longer be supporting Python 2 and 3 concurrently, but rather go Python 3 fully. And that means have, uh, that I have to increase the major version because then it will definitely be backwards incompatible. Um, and uh, yeah, so this is what I did. Uh, I marked the devil branch as uh, as 2.0.0.2.0.0.dev, uh, 2 and I made it require Python 3. So there we go. It's uh, yeah, it's happening. <laughs> um, okay. Um, what are the next steps? So 
uh, I already hinted at it. Uh, one for one for one is looking good. So um, the goal is to finalize uh, it completely. Uh, there there are still two tickets I think open, and I want to take a look at them and, and look if I can, yeah, if I can implement them or not. Um, and if not, if there is something that I can do to make it easier, maybe long term. Um, but once those are out of the way, I will, yeah, sit down, write a change log, and um, uh, put the first release candidate for one for one together. Um, another thing that I really want to do ASAP is um, help Guy prepare a first Python three based Octopi build, so that not not necessarily as a as a release candidate, but at least switch the nightly builds over to Python three, because now that we have more than 50% plug-in uh, uh, Python 3 com uh, Python 3 plug-in compatibility. What a word construct. Um, yeah, it makes sense to think about that and actually go for it because, yeah, Python 2 is end of life and we need to get moving. Um, yeah. And uh, another thing that I need to do, um, which targets devil, so 2.0, um, is... Um, I made it Python, made it require Python 3, but all the stuff, all the Python 2, 3 compatibility layers that we built into the source during the migration to Python 3 support are still in there. And I don't want to keep them in there. So this is, um, this is a necessary deep dive to extract all that stuff from there again and make it Python 3 only. And I will probably miss some stuff here and there, but yeah, this is definitely something that I want to, want and I need to do. And another thing that's been bothering me for ages now and that I also need to get tackled and I hope I will be able to, yeah, at least start on this next month is, um, so currently most of the open tickets on the GitHub issue tracker are not issues. They are feature requests. And feature requests are tricky in an issue tracker, at least with a pro certain project size, because yeah, a lot of these issues are, or, or rather a lot of these feature requests are actually not feature requests for core features in Octoprint, but rather stuff that is marked as, yeah, nice plugin idea maybe. And um, I would really prefer feature requests in the future to live on the forum because there I can also do stuff like uh, voting. Um, it's easier for people to find because a lot of people simply do not know about the issue tracker or don't know how to navigate it. And uh, the, the, yeah, the, the forum simply gives me the possibilities or gives us the possibilities to maybe also install plugins that can help with stuff like that. So we also just, uh, with, the, with the last update, uh, Jubaleth installed the Knowledge Base Explorer plugin, which also allows now to easier, e more easily navigate the, the forum, uh, the FAQ and the, and the guides and all that. And stuff like this is why the forums are also very interesting for me for feature request tracking. Um, uh, so that is something that I need to do and or rather that I want to do and I think I need to do um, because it will make the issue tracker be usable actually as an issue tracker and me no longer completely losing an overview of what is open and what has to be tackled and what not and, and all that. And I already mentioned it, something I also hope to be able to look into is um, starring plugins as a as a as a way of rating them, or rather as a way of um, giving them a thumbs up or liking them uh, via the plugin repository. Uh, so the thing is, GitHub has this. Most of the plugins are hosted on GitHub, and you can, if you have a GitHub uh, login, you can uh, star a repository on GitHub, which is just like liking it, giving it giving it a thumbs up, and all that. And this functionality is. Uh, something that I would like to see also on the plugin repository so that if the plugin is hosted on GitHub, you can click a little button. And this way, after you have logged into, into GitHub from the plugin repository, this way you can then star the 
uh, plugin. And I think that would also help plugin authors a lot in maybe seeing, uh, yeah, how many people actually like their plugin because, yeah, having plugins installed or, or yeah, yeah, having them installed doesn't necessarily mean that they are also used. So, um, yeah, the, this this more active feedback, like I really like this thing, uh, would hopefully also yeah give an additional metric to plugin authors whether their stuff is being used and also to other users whether a plugin is something that people like. So yeah, that would be nice. But yeah, I have an idea how to pull it off uh, without. Too much trouble as we as i mentioned the plugin repository is a static web page which makes logging in a bit tricky so yeah uh, but i have an idea how it could work and uh, yeah i want to investigate that a bit further as well as as time permits we'll have to see okay um and that was what I wanted to do with regards to next steps. And now let me quickly take a look at the live chat, which is completely deserted today. Okay, that makes it easier. Um, and then we can switch over to the to the screen again and take a look at the live at the at the usage stats. So this is again the last seven days. I told you last time already I cannot really load this screen anymore with 30 days because that yeah, brings the the instance on which the the uh, the Elastic Search engine runs to its knees regularly. So I'd rather not risk it. But what we see is so no 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 changes actually. So we are still at roughly 60k per seven days active instances, 84 years printed time during the last seven days, the regular sawtooth pattern thingy or rather rather a zigzag pattern of print. Uh, printed hours and a slowly but steadily increasing number of Python 3 installs out in the wild. Um, and let me just quickly maybe load this single metric for the last 30 days. If it loads, please load. We are looking at this little spinner thingy here. Oh, right, we'll, we'll just give it time and look over here. Um, and this is the print jobs per the last 30 days. And things seem to have normalized again after this initial PPE run uh, during uh, the month of April, where everyone and their mother was printing uh, face shields, apparently. And uh, yeah, so uh, weekends are still a bit more heavy in usage and yeah no no change here but some new metrics down here so remember then i wondered um about these these cancel spikes um i decided to add some new information here and this is the duration at point of cancellation uh, because, yeah, we all had the suspicion that uh, most of the prints getting cancelled were getting cancelled within the first 10 or so sec uh, minutes. And yeah, it turns out this is actually true. 50% uh, of all cancelled prints get cancelled before uh, within the first 12 minutes. Um, and this is also reflected here. 25% get even cancelled uh, within the first three minutes. So bell, the heat up, heat up has barely finished. The first layer is getting put down, bam, cancel. Um, this would be this spike here. So most of the prints, as I said, they don't go past, or, or rather most of the canceled prints happen um, within this 10 minute or this magical, let's say 15 minute window. And then we have a long tail of stuff that, yeah, gets cancelled way, 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 way later. But yeah, so theory, uh, we had a theory and we have uh, confirmed it. Yeah. And in the future, we will hopefully also see when these numbers change in some way or the other and then can react accordingly if needed. So has this number loaded in the meantime? Yeah. So also pretty much the same as before, 90k roughly per 30 days. Um, this is bit down from the um, from the peak numbers that we that I saw during the pandemic month 
uh, the, the major pandemic months, which I'm calling April now. Um, but yeah, I mean, not that much down. So that seems to be fairly stable as well. And that was about all that I prepared with regards to the stats. Usually I would also show you the plugin stats, but you can now take a look at them yourself by just going here and looking here. So I figured I would leave this um, in the future, leave this out in the future. Um, yeah, that was that. And with this, we can actually switch over here because we are entering the Q&A segment now. So um, let's take a look at the first question, which was by an anonymous user. I don't have a name. Uh, and which is, uh, are there any stats on the types of webcams used? And yeah, this question is going to be answered very, very uh, quickly. No, um, because the thing is, Octoprint doesn't integrate with the web webcam itself. Um, it only gets a, a, a URL for the stream to embed on the web page, which it doesn't even embed itself. It just inject, it puts the URL in the in the generated HTML, and then your browser loads the stream. So Octoprint never even consumes the stream itself, and it also gets a URL or um, yeah, a relative or an absolute uh, URL to um, to the snapshot uh, place where. No, that always has to be an absolute URL. Uh, uh, it gets a URL where to fetch snapshots for the timelapse function. And it does consume these images, but it doesn't do anything with them. And it could also not really fingerprint webcam models from them. So um, the thing that usually does um, does produce these this, this stream and these snapshots, at least on Octopi, is MJPEG streamer. So maybe MJPEG streamer could possibly determine the model of webcam used and all that, but uh, as far as I know, it also doesn't do that, and uh, it doesn't. It probably would also not make this um, information public. Um, so yeah, currently there is no sensible way of getting this kind of information, and it therefore Octoprint also does not try to get it and also doesn't track it. So no stats. Sorry, the only thing that I can offer here maybe is uh, some by now quite outdated um, survey results from um, I think four years ago or three years ago that I did with my patrons um, where I also asked if you are if they are using a webcam and if so which model and if I remember correctly the most common one back then was a mixture of the one or other Logitech USB webcam and or the Raspberry Pi uh, camera module. But yeah, that was about it. But as I said, I have no idea if these stats are still accurate today. And this is also why I did not now include them here because yeah, they are pretty outdated by now. Okay, um, that brings us to the next question by Yander. Uh, is there any way to make the filament sensor of the printer functional with Octoprint in a way so that it still works with standalone prints from SD card, maybe with another firmware like Clipper? So I'm not entirely sure of the context of this question here. Um, I'm going to make some assumptions. Um, if we're talking about a simple filament sensor that you, you can also just connect to your printer board, so the, the, the controller of your printer instead of Octoprint, then uh, yes, there is a simple way and it relies entirely on firmware. Um, the thing is, Octoprint supports something called action commands. And uh, these action commands allow firmware uh, to open up a back channel to Octoprint, uh, pretty much to control it. Uh, like to tell it to please pause a print, to resume a print, to cancel a print, stuff like this. And it's a very simple format. And uh, at least the current mainline Marlin builds also already enabled it. And I think even by default um, in case of filament runout and all that. But the problem as usual is of course that we have a very, very fragmented firmware landscape and a lot of users are using the firmware that comes with their printer and never update it. and um, 
Printer vendors usually take some ancient old version of either Marlin or Repetier or Smoothie or whatnot and then um, fiddle around with it, sometimes break stuff, in, often break stuff in the process, and then, yeah, never merge from upstream again. And uh, that means that this feature, while documented um, on the G-Code RepRep wiki, and thus as official as things can get within the uh, com uh, consumer 3D printing space, yeah, has not really propagated through all, all printers out there. So if you want a filament sensor to work uh, with your printer in such a way that uh, it also notifies Octoprint to please pause a print when a filament run out happens, and then maybe also to resume it when you have taken care of that filament run out at the printer itself, then you might have to do a firmware upgrade uh, to a proper mainline Marlin version, which then uh, will also in general work better than whatever your printer ship with usually. Usually, there are exceptions, but usually. Um, and I'm pretty sure that Clipper also supports this stuff, but you don't necessarily have to switch to it. Just the mainline Marlin would probably suffice, but yeah. You will probably need another uh, another firmware. It depends entirely on the printer. Maybe the printer already even supports this, and you just have to enable it somewhere. I don't know. Um, that this is what I meant with I'm, I'm missing some context here. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I hope this this answers the question. Um, okay. And that brings us to the next one by John. What's the next big feature upgrade you'd like to do for Octoprint? Not necessarily what you have time for, but what do you think is missing that you'd like to add? Um, a new user interface. Uh, yeah, the, the current one is uh, based on technology that was more or less state-of-the-art almost eight years ago, and you can imagine what that means for its state-of-the-artness now. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I really want to change that. Uh, I built uh, the UI plugin uh, mix-in in order to allow to concurrently build up another um, uh, another uh, uh, core UI, basically, and then allowing plugins to gradually work over to that. But so far, I have not actually gotten around to utilizing it for that purpose. Um, or, or even started really with planning how and what to do. But um, I've actually somewhat started on this uh, on this particular point already, because um, yeah, I'm currently spending uh, a more or less significant amount of my free time uh, on working through a bunch of online courses. Um, currently, I'm doing uh, something like a 40 to 42 hour course on React.js. And after that, I have another 20 or 30 hour, I can't remember exactly, a, a course for Vue.js Vue um, queued. And when I'm through both of them, then I'll try to figure out, uh, yeah, if I want to, yeah, whether I want to commit to either uh, for, for creating a new UI. Um, I have to admit that uh, when I started with the React course, I was pretty much yeah, like, uh, <laughs> at what what I found out about this framework, and the more I've worked with it during the course and during the the assignments of the course, um, I, uh, uh, I I I started to like it. So yeah, currently it's uh, it has a couple of thumbs up from my side, but I haven't yet seen the comp uh, the the the, um, the competitor. So uh, yeah, I'm not going to make decisions at all before I've not dug into both of them. Yeah. And before you ask, Angular is out of the question because I've not heard great things about it. So, yep. And um, the thing is that once I figured out whether I like one or the other and whether the ideas that I have for a new UI uh, work with, uh, with the chosen framework, there's also the question of, um, so whatever I choose, it also has to work for plugin developers, right? So it has to be something that 
can easily be taken up and yeah which doesn't make it too difficult to wrap your head around the concepts so this is also of course something that i'm trying to take in or not not trying that i have to take into account here and that i'm trying my best to um to uh get a feeling for also by how long it takes me to um to uh <laughs> To wrap my head around and uh, johnny just said on the on the live chat that they recently made that choice and they selected react as there are 10 times more people using it than Vue. otherwise they would have selected Vue. yeah uh, this amount of people is also something where i'm yeah i'm i'm, I'm not so entirely sure if this is this is uh, uh, um uh, if this is um oh. The English word is missing right now. Sorry. Um, if this is a criteria <laughs> that I I should take a look at, um, because in my case, I think the bigger challenge will not be to find people working on it because, yeah, I think just because it is written in React and hence there's 10 more, t 10 times more people who like it or know, know that, know the framework that will not necessarily mean that there are ten, that it's, that, that it is 10 times more likely to find uh, contributors to Octoprint, which would be my personal, um, uh, my personal, uh, goal because yeah, I'm still doing this more or less alone. So, uh, the more help the merrier. Um, but of course it's also possibly a factor. That doesn't help me though, that there is a ton of users out there who not necessarily do have a 3D printer and, and thus also an interest in working on this stuff. If it is really, really, really tricky to wrap your head around and thus locks out uh, potential plugin authors. So yeah, I'm kind of balancing the things here. Um, but so far from what I've seen, I think with yeah, with some good tutorials and all that, and maybe another uh, YouTube uh, live uh, demonstration on how to whip up a plugin. Um, once I have figured out how to actually make something pluggable in React, um, it should be something that people can wrap their uh, head around fairly easy. So this is so far, I have not spotted stuff in React that felt like a complete yeah, blocking issue for a uh, plugin author adopt adoption. But we'll see. I still have to finish the course. I'm halfway through. Um, and then I also have to do the, the view one. So that's going to be interesting. But yeah, it's it definitely with regards to popularity, React is definitely light years ahead currently of Vue, but that doesn't necessarily mean anything. I can remember times when Angular was like uh, the, the cool new thing that everyone needed to use. And then half a year later, everyone started shunning it. And uh, yeah, this is always a bit tricky with Java in the JavaScript space from my perspective. Personally, I don't know, in the back end stuff always feels a bit more stable and less volatile. <laughs> um, but yeah, this is also why I'm only looking at established big players for uh, technology choice for this thing and not, um, yeah, whatever is the new hot thing, the new hot kit in town this week. Yeah. Um, okay. And uh, yeah, coming back to the question, um, another thing that I would love to do, which would be less of a feature upgrade and more like, uh, yeah, a big refactoring upgrade is, um, separating all of Octoprint's backend into separate, uh, into separate processes because the Python guild and all that makes it extremely tricky to utilize multi-core processors and well, yeah, they've become way more common now with the Raspberry Pi uh, 2, 3, and 4, and, and no one actually using the one anymore, or next to no one. I mean, we all know there are still people, and there are also people who ignore my advice to not use the 0 or the 0W with Octoprint. So these are, of course, also in the single core department, but most of the installations out there are now on multi-core pro uh, processor systems, and it would be really nice if I was able to utilize them, but as things are now, I cannot really, and yeah, this is kind of annoying. The problem is that such a process inter uh, separation 
into maybe something like an interface layer so for the for the api the web sockets and all that anything communicating with the network a logic layer that plugs everything together and then uh, a g code sender or in other backend systems um yeah that would pretty much new half of the really popular plugins out there because uh it would be pretty pretty tricky to allow them to share the state the, the the internal state as they do now and to also inject them into multiple processes and all that so that would be a bit of a nightmare so yeah this is on the it would be really nice but i don't see this happening in the near future list and it would also be a uh, Excuse my French, but a shit ton of work. But yeah, I think it would do wonders for the performance. Yeah. Uh, oh, and uh, another thing, and that would actually be a bit of a feature upgrade, is going not only Pi 3 only, but reworking the code base so it actually makes use of all the nifty cool new shit that uh, Python 3 allows me to do. For example, async IO and all that stuff. So there's a lot of stuff in there really cool features uh, at which I've looked like a really thirsty person for the past couple of years, always going like it would be no so nice to have this, but ah, I'm still on Python 2 and now it is in reach to start utilizing these things. But yeah, some would also require quite extensive rewrites, rewrites and that, yeah, that might also be tricky with regards to plugins again. But so these are the three top big chunks of things that i've not really uh, not already started on in some way or the other that come to mind um that are yeah that i would really love to do if i had the time um and if i didn't disrupt the whole plug-in space in the process as well but yeah maybe one day i'll find a way yeah okay next question again by yanda why is it recommended to disable the serial lock? My Raspberry Pi, uh, Raspberry 4 uh, seems to have more than enough power to handle the additional I.O. So there are actually two reasons. And I'm pretty sure also that this question originated from a recent ticket that we had on the Octopi, Octopi issue tracker. Um, first of all, not everyone obviously has a Pi 4. And uh, having to write the serial log while your printer is printing and streaming G-code as fast as possible to your printer can cause slowdowns and um, yeah, to, due to all the data that needs to be written. I've mitigated these slowdowns in the past a bit with uh, changes to how the logger works there. So these are not as big of a problem as they used to be back in the day, but they are still there. And of course, also the better hardware these days makes them less likely to occur as well. But still, they can, and thus I recommend to disable it because I don't want people opening up tickets uh, about yeah serial lock disrupting their prints, and I don't want to disgruntle people about uh, by serial lock causing issues with their prints. And uh, the second reason is that serial lock is at its core and yeah for, by its very nature a debug log that's take uh, that's tailored towards capturing the full picture of the whole printer communication which means that thing gets huge and this is intentional so serial log gets when enabled gets rotated on every connect to the printer so whenever you click connect a new the old serial log is closed and uh, uh, I mean, it obviously was already closed, but it gets rotated away and a new one gets created. And this one will keep growing as long as you are connected to the printer and it will lock every single line that gets sent to the printer and every single line that comes back to the printer and some uh, diagnostic stuff in between that gets also locked to the terminal tab that you might have seen here and there. Um, Things like, uh, I don't know, firmware uh, supports busy protocol and stuff like that. That will also get uh, locked in there. So if you keep your printer connected for days and maybe also print something like 300 megabytes of G-code in between, all this will be in the serial log. So it will grow really, really big. And as I said, this is intentional because the idea um, or the goal of the serial log is 
as I said, to capture the full communication with the printer, with everything that happened ever since the connection started. Because if there is, a, if there, if, if we are trying to analyze a problem that only arises after, I don't know, 50% of a print shop or such, it won't suffice for me to just have the last 500 lines or something. I also need to see the whole history until we got there from the very, very, very start of the connection, because that tells me a lot about the firmware as well at the start. And it also, yeah, a, a problem after 50% of your print job might have started at the very start of the print job already. And uh, in the protocol, I mean, and for that, I need the whole thing. Obviously, this is like completely orth orthogonal to uh, what you would usually want uh, from, uh, from, from a production setup. You don't want to lock uh, every single bit that gets transmitted and you do not want to have lock files grow and grow and grow and grow and grow until you intentionally disconnect from something. But for debugging, this is absolutely crucial and has yeah allowed me to find a ton of bugs that otherwise I would not have been able to find um, from people halfway across the world. So yeah, this is simply why I say only enable it when you need it, but then please enable it. So if there is a communication error, if there's something weird going on between Octoprint and the printer, I need this log. Enable it, reproduce the problem, share the log with me, but otherwise keep the log off because it will only consume disk space and yeah, no one will look at it and it might even cause issues with the printer. So there is no real reason to keep it on. There's only a reason to enable it when there are actual problems and when you're trying to catch these problems. And once you have caught them in the lock, then you can disable it immediately again and share the lock and then we can analyze stuff and try to solve the problem. Um, yeah. So I hope that answers the questions. It's, it's, it's simply a debugging tool and you don't keep the debugging tools enabled in production. And the next and I think final question for today by Aldo. Uh, you commit messages. Sorry, I'm stumbling over my tongue today. Um, your commit messages start with a Unicode emoji to show the type of change. This certainly makes your commit history more joyful to look at, but is there more to it? Do you add these characters manually or is there some automated process? So, uh, first of all, these, uh, these emojis actually do have a name and they are a bit of a standard. They are called Gitmoji. And um, there's this overview here of what they mean. And you, when you take a look at, at, at Octoprint's Git uh, commit history, that's, that is one of the most common ones. And of course, that one is one of the most common ones as well. This one also occasionally shows up and all that. So um, yeah, I uh, used to just, most of them I have, uh, most of the ones that I regularly use, I have memorized by now and just use them. Uh, directly and uh, for the others I used to keep this open uh, in, a, in a tab and just refer, refer to it whenever I was looking for something but then I discovered that there are actually uh, plugins for PyCharm and Visual Studio Code to just yeah um, allow to look up this stuff right from the commit dialog which is really really nice and I originally came over uh, came across the the concept of these things uh, I think in the touch UI repo and I really like that just from a glance at the Git uh, uh, history, I could immediately see, um, yeah, which of the commits were bug fixes, which were new features, which changed stuff, where dependencies were uh, changed, and all that. So that really, really helped me a ton. And uh, yeah, so much so actually that uh, I've added my own uh, variants uh, variants uh, in, to to this list here. Uh, for example, I also use a little umbrella when I do um, hardening against user error or uh, a a API errors or something like that. And that just, yeah, it helps me also when I need to prepare release notes and all that to get an overview of what did I when, did I do when and all that. And yeah, 
but there is no automation. Um, I yeah, I actually consciously have to decide what is what and uh, such or every time that I commit. But by now it's just second nature and works. Funnily enough, I only use them in the Octoprint repository, I think. I can't remember that I actually ever used them somewhere else. But yeah, for Octoprint, they have worked really well for me. Okay, and that was the final question from the backlog. And now let me take a quick look into the live chat. Uh, Foo suggests maybe a configuration to rotate the serial log after one gigabyte. No. I really, if it takes one gigabyte to f to match up the problems, then I need this full log. It's just, I could do that and it would probably be fine until it isn't. So yeah, I really want this log to contain the full communication between, uh, between connect and disconnect, or at least between connect and disable. Um, and it should only be used for that. And if people try to keep it, then I can't help them. I, it's simply not, yeah, you have to actively, actively enable it. So what I could do though, is um, maybe add a little pop-up or something like that. Then if you, uh, that, that shows you that serial lock is enabled to, as a reminder, as a bit of a next screen to also disable it again, once you have reproduced the issue. That, could actually be a good idea to uh, prevent people from forgetting to disable it again and then ending up with a ton of uh, a ton of data. Then again, usually people probably won't stay connected to their printer long enough to ever reach these kinds of data um, uh, volumes. And Octoprint only keeps the latest plus I think three old ones, and that's it. But yeah, I'll. I think I'll actually look into a little notification that serial log is enabled or something like that. Some reminder thing, something flashing in the terminal tab. I don't know. I'll, I'll think about it, but yeah. Okay. So, but I think that is about it. I don't see. Uh, regarding the, the earlier thing about flashing uh, a mainline Marlin, Fuba also said, I'm a bit anxious that the stock firmware of the printer has some necessary modification not included within the current Marlin. That may well be, but from my personal experience and also from looking across um, across uh, tickets and uh, support requests on the forum and all that, usually when you flash a mainline build, you will be surprised to find that stuff works better than before. Because as I said, most printer vendors really, let's say, do a suboptimal job at keeping their firmware maintained. Um, and don't even get me started on how much stuff gets broken by vendor forks. Like just the other day, we had a new temperature format uh, by, I think it was some Creality update for some printer model that I forgot what it was. And it doubled all the identifiers in the temperature response. I don't even know how you would code that, but yeah, this is stuff that happens all the time with vendor forks, which is why I say, please use mainline firmware. Don't use vendor firmware. They just, so many of them don't seem to know what they are doing and what they, are breaking with the changes that they just built in. They, they, they kill established existing standard responses. They ship stuff like that. There's this one CBD made it and also Thrill made it firmware fork out there, which looks like a bastard child between Repetier and Marlin or something like that and behaves completely drunk and utilizes firmware messages for one thing, but for something entirely else. So by like the polar opposite meaning all of a sudden. And yeah, that, that, that firmware alone prompted me to uh, create a 
yeah, create a hook inside Octoprint, so or not a hook, but to make it to make the Octoprint firmware safety thingy in in the future also warn about broken firmware, not only about unsafe firmware, but also about broken firmware. Because I'm drowning in support requests just thanks to this one firmware fork that has made it across pretty much every second Chinese printer out there, apparently. And um yeah. Prints stall, stuff doesn't hold correctly, temperatures don't get configured fully, and uh, then of course people go to Octoprint's community forum because they are using Octoprint when their printer misbehaves, and just because the firmware sucks. Yeah, but let's not get on this soapbox now. It's uh, five past six, and I'm kind of tired, so I'm going to wrap this up now. Um, actually. Back to me, back to me, back to me. Ha. Um, yeah, so uh, that was that. Um, the next one of these I will do somewhere around mid July ish, probably, uh, possibly a bit later. I have to see how it fits into my calendar and also what else happens in the weeks leading up to it. So, because, uh, yeah, seriously, when I'm, when I'm, when I'm, yeah, at 130% for all, all of the week, then the last thing that I want to do at a Friday evening is the live stream. So, um, yeah, I always have to keep an eye on that as well, but I, I try to do it as soon as I can uh, in this usual monthly time frame. And I will also post the appointment on Patreon as always, and I will post the recording of this one somewhere next week, I hope. And, uh, yeah, when should I find something again that... Um, makes sense for an octoprint code in chat live coding just look me over the shoulder kind of deal i will also just announce that on youtube again so click the bell and all that you know the drill um uh, and until we meet again uh, all i can say is uh, thanks for being here i hope it was interesting and uh, i hope that all the questions were satisfactorily answered <laughs> and uh, I also hope that I see you next time and that you stay healthy. And until then, happy printing. Bye.